Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this important briefing on the humanitarian reasons for a ceasefire in Gaza. This panel was organized by the Friends Committee on National Legislation, or FCNL, Demand Progress, ANERA, Churches for Middle East Peace, and Oxfam America. My name is Odelia Matter, and I am the Program Assistant for Middle East Policy at FCNL. I'm also an Israeli citizen and moved to D.C. two months ago from the city of Beersheba in southern Israel. Before moving here, I'd worked for several human rights organizations to try and promote long-lasting solutions to the ongoing violence we've seen all of our lives. Um, I'm a personal stakeholder in this issue as I have lost friends on October 7th know people who are being held hostage and have friends from Gaza who I haven't been able to contact because of the communications blackout. Over this past month of war, we've all seen the continuous and tragic loss of life and human suffering. Today, there are fewer resources on the ground reporting on the reality of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza than ever before. And that's why our speakers today have some of the most crucial insight due to their important work on humanitarian responses to this ongoing crisis. I'd like to welcome Sean Carroll, President and CEO of ANERA, Daniela Zizi, Country Manager for Palestine at Humanity and Inclusion, Steve Sosby, President of Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, and Bushra Khalidi, Oxfam, America's Policy Lead in Israel and the Occupied Palestinian Territory. Um, each panelist will give a five to seven minute presentation, and then we will have a 25 minute Q&A section where we'll be addressing questions that have been sent to us before this briefing. So please use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask your questions, which we may address if there is time left. We will start with an overview, a general overview of the humanitarian crises, uh, hearing from Sean Carroll, who is the president and CEO of ANERA. He's an international humanitarian and development leader with nearly 40 years experience working in more than 70 countries throughout the world. As president and CEO of ANERA, which is formerly American Near East Refugee Aid, Sean leads a staff of 150 in Lebanon, Palestine, including the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, Jordan, and Washington, D.C., delivering over $150 million of humanitarian and development assistance annually to refugees and vulnerable communities in the Middle East. So, Sean, starting with you, could you please provide us with a general overview of the humanitarian crises in Gaza, including the situation of conditions before the bombing? And if you could also touch specifically on some of the difficulties ANERA is facing. Thank you, Odili, and thank you everyone for organizing this and thank you everyone for being here um, and uh, condolences um, to everyone who, have, who has lost people, who fear for people who are suffering from secondary trauma, as we all are. Um, these are the darkest days I've seen in my six years uh, as head of an era. And I, I, you know, unfortunately, it's already surpassed what happened in 1967, which, uh, which was the reason an era was formed 55 years ago. And uh, and really is worse than than the Nakba in 1948. Um, <clears throat> there needs to be a ceasefire now because innocent people are dying, uh, and that's something that we all say at the beginning and end of all of our uh, interventions. And if, you know, if we forget to, we should remember to. Um, it's incredible, I think, to all of us that this is going on. Uh, now entering its sixth week, and uh, it has to stop. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Gaza before October 7th and why it's important as we look at this now. I think one you know, difficulty, a huge challenge, is the overall dehumanization of Palestinians, but also the lack of information about Gaza. Um, people who haven't been there. And of course, you know, 99.98% of the world's population hasn't been there because it's not easy to get there. They don't have a full picture of what Gaza is. And sometimes we, um, by talking about one part of the reality, we, uh, we forget to mention the other part. You know, it's true when you talk about how much of the water is unsafe and how much 
unemployment there is and how much trauma there is from uh, war after war, bombing campaign after bombing campaign. Um, and that um, the phrase that we use, and I, you know, I, it's, um, I think it's, it's, it, it cuts both ways. It can be detrimental to say it's it's the world's largest open air prison because then people who don't know Gaza don't know everything else that it is, which is a population of over 2.2 million people of the vast majority of which are just trying to have a decent life, take care of their family, have security, have jobs, and they're going about their lives, going to school, going to work, farming, working in hospitals. And if you don't know that reality, then it's hard to recognize just how a tragic and horrific this is and and we know the numbers and i um i i congratulate the effort that's that's called we are not numbers and it's important for everyone to to know and remember um that uh, that no one is just numbers and 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 it tends to get left up to uh the numbers and the numbers are are horrific and that's the biggest reason why we we have to see a a, a ceasefire enough is enough um and uh, I think we all know, but we have to keep calling it what it is. We have to keep pointing out crimes of humanity, uh, war crimes, collective punishment, um, and that's what this is. And I, I think it's helpful if people recognize um, that the vast majority of Palestinians in, in Gaza um, are, are, are not to blame for any of this. And... Uh, and are, are suffering, uh, not just the ones that have been uh, killed and injured and lost uh, lost family. And of course, at this point, there's hardly anyone in Gaza who hasn't lost family, but everyone is traumatized. Um, as we respond to the humanitarian crisis, and we've delivered almost 4 million meals and, uh, since October 7th, and we're delivering medicines and medical supplies and hygiene kits and doing whatever we can, um, we're also reminded, and it's very hard, it's it's hard not just uh, because of the horrific uh, uh, killing, loss of life, the destruction, um, the horror of it all. It's also hard because it's not what, if, if it's, it's not obviously not what uh, Palestinians in Gaza want to go through, and it's not what any of us, we, we want to work on long-term human development. We want to support Palestinians and their aspirations for, for life and livelihoods. Um, and we're reminded at this time that that long-term human development, part of the part of the reason why uh, uh, a humanitarian crisis exists and why it's so hard to meet it is because there isn't enough human development uh, going on when there isn't war, when there aren't bombs dropping. And we're reminded of it when we <clears throat> are doing our humanitarian work by seeing that where Anira did do long-term human development projects, solar, systems, water filtration systems, rooftop gardens, then there's there's a they're having an easier time of surviving this onslaught. So we got in the second week of bombing, our staff who are mostly getting calls of desperation from from groups of families huddled together in overcrowding situations saying, please bring us food, please bring us water, we're starving, we're thirsty. But they got one nice call in the second week of bombing from our farmers cooperative in Rafa. And they called to say, we just wanted to let you know that because Anira put in a solar system and a reverse osmosis water filtration system that's powered by the solar panels, we're still producing food and we're feeding a thousand people. Um, and part of our response has been working with those farmers, working with fish farmers to ensure that food doesn't rot and that it is distributed. And if there were more of that, if there were more rooftop gardens and farmers cooperatives and solar systems, then cutting off the electricity, cutting off the water, um, running out of fuel would be uh, easier. Uh, obviously, long-term human development isn't about just being resilient to the next emergency. It's actually trying to avoid emergency and, and uh, give people um, some hope for the future and, and, uh, and uh, 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 some meeting of of their own uh, aspirations and dreams. Um, it's hard for me to talk about it, knowing that I can't really talk about this the way that our staff could and our staff can't because uh, it's too traumatic to talk about or they don't have enough battery or they're too busy doing the humanitarian work. And I, I, I wish that you could talk with them all. I hope that you'll 
be able to talk with them soon. It's in, it's in unfathomable to me what they're going through. It literally is, it's a, I can't imagine um, what it's like. All I know is that um, they recognize, and not all of them, we only have 12 staff in Gaza. Two of them lost 26 family members. Um, we found out a few days ago that someone who had interned for us last year, someone who had gotten a Humphrey scholarship fellowship from the State Department to study in the U.S., he and his whole family were killed. Um, so the the uh, the tragedy has hit uh, close to home, and some of our staff are too uh, traumatized or paralyzed to work. But the majority of those twelve are are working, and that's their coping. They're trying to do as much as they can to serve um, their fellow uh, Palestinians in in Gaza. But it's uh, it's unfathomable to me. It's hard to imagine how they keep going when really, as we as we know from the the numbers and and the reporting. Uh, even though, as you pointed out, reporting is getting scarce, but we know that no corner of Gaza really is safe, um, and that points to 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 really what is a the war crime of collective punishment. Um, so the the it's a huge, massive humanitarian humanitarian crisis, not one that I uh, imagined before, but one that we certainly feared after we saw what what happened on October seventh, um, and it's uh, the amount of aid that we can do, and much less the recovery, can't really uh, scale up until the bombing stops, the uh, the border is more fully open. We're all, we've all become experts now on the number of trucks that are supposed to go into Gaza. And so you know that in, in relatively normal times, and there aren't normal times because Gaza has been blockaded under siege by both Israel and, and Egypt for the past 16 years. So there is, there's no normal, but in, in more normal times when there isn't a total siege, four or 500 trucks a day, 10, 12,000 a month goes in. So that means the first two weeks of this war, when it was completely shut, there were five or 6,000 trucks of goods that should have come in, um, anywhere from a fourth to a half of those for uh, food. And we're still not seeing the numbers we need to see. And I don't know if people have noticed, I've noticed, I haven't heard anybody else say it, but I'm telling everyone I can, there have not been two consecutive days of an increase in the number of trucks, the number of the amount of aid going in. So it's as if someone is saying, we control this. We'll let the number of trucks go up one day, but the next day it's going down and don't expect it to go up two days in a row. So now after, what are we, 17, 18, uh, 20 days of trucks going in, we haven't had uh, a single instance of increase in aid two days in a row. Um, and sometimes there's a dramatic drop off. So we're not getting the amount of, of, of aid that needs to come in and people literally now are starving and they're, uh, they're dying or at risk of dying of, of dehydration and the uh, fuel uh, being out is, is, is affecting uh, everything. So it, it, it is just a, a human tragedy, a humanitarian crisis, uh, a war crime of collective punishment that is uh, unfathomable at, at this day and age, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to think about what would, you know, what would we be doing if if the level of of uh, of destruction and killing, uh, including of women and children, were the were the same in in Ukraine? What would the reaction be in the world? And I just we have to keep asking ourselves that. And uh, it's time for people to recognize that this can't go on. The occupation has to end. There needs to be uh, something new. We can't repeat this again because we're. Uh, this is not the same as it's been the last few years. It's not tolerable. It's not something can pick up the pieces and and make do until the next time. There has to be a, a real difference. Um, I'll stop there. I there's a lot I'd like to say about what I think uh, we we will do and need to do on recovery and reconstruction. We don't know where the line will be at the end of this. We don't know whether. Um, some Palestinians will be pushed or will choose to to uh, to to leave, uh, move into Sinai. Whether anybody will be allowed to move back north or whether everyone will be crammed into the southern part of the Gaza Strip, um, but we know that there will be huge uh, needs. And I I'll end it on a high note. I can say that you know, whenever there's Whenever there's a crisis, an emergency, donors step up and they give a lot. After the Beirut blast, we had thousands of new donors. Um, Anira has almost 30,000 new donors since October 7th. And we're also getting 
uh, funding, and I'm, I'm sure others, Steve, will talk about the the huge surge in support. And I think there's a there's a recognition, not just that there's a a crisis of humanity, and we all have to step up and face humanity, but actually that the, that that there's a real a reckoning and a and a time to recognize that uh, Palestinian uh, aspirations for for equal rights and for freedom and justice, and and people are supporting that, and we're seeing also interestingly. Uh, a lot of corporations and 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 sort of more mainstream uh, uh, organizations in the United States that stood with Israel as they as they should and as would be expected on October seventh, and then also said we can't forget the Palestinians, and so the American Federation of Teachers will be giving its funding to Gaza response to Anira. We have money from cash from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, UBS Bank has has made a near their match for employees and clients. So some corporations that we wouldn't normally expect to, to be funding uh, our work, I think are recognizing the need for, for a humanitarian response. And, and so that's one bright spot. And I think we will see um, some change that comes out of this. Thanks very much. Sean, thank you so much for your insight based in what sounds like many years of experience. And we hope that your colleagues remain as safe as possible. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Danila Zizi, who has served as the country manager for humanitarian uh, humanity and inclusion in Palestine for the past two years. Danila holds a master's degree in criminal law with expertise in international humanitarian law. She has 13 years of experience as an aid worker, having worked in a mix of conflict areas in the Middle East. She leads a team of approximately 45 dedicated staff based in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Tanila herself is based in East Jerusalem. So Tanila, um, I know humanity and inclusion works a lot in particular with persons with disabilities in Gaza. Could you share insights into the challenges that you are all facing in this work due to the Israeli bombing and incursion, please? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Al. Thank you also very much for having us today here. <clears throat> I must admit that before coming here today, I, I, I asked my colleagues in Gaza if they wanted me to deliver a specific story or a specific uh, set of messaging. And I received so many <laughs> that I was a bit overwhelmed in choosing which one would have been the, first, the perfect fit for the kind of briefing that we are delivering today, also respecting the timing that we are given and the word that everyone has to get out. So. I actually will have a more generic concept and then going down to a more specific story that we collected in the past weeks. Uh, despite of the minimal communication and the very little resources that we are left with, NHI staff is still somehow operational in Gaza. And in fact, this is why I believe we are receiving so many calls. My colleagues are receiving calls, especially from the north of Gaza. And I would say that the primary request of help that they get from the North in support, uh, in transporting actually their caregivers and persons with disabilities from the North to the South, because they believe that the South would be safer for them. But at the same time, the movement is quite challenging. And I want to explain why. Uh, what we call the humanitarian corridor that has been deemed safe is actually constituted of a set of roads that are destroyed. Wheelchairs cannot go on destroyed roads. Persons with disabilities cannot walk for kilometers on destroyed roads and they cannot use cars because we have no fuel. No one has fuel in Gaza anymore. And I think that also today came out the latest call from UNRWA in this regard. So walking is the only option. And it's a concept that is very simple to us, but it can be fundamentally impossible for a good part of the population. So all of these people that are faced with a, an impossible dilemma, considering that they still believe that the South is safe, they have to face their family members and decide whether they would leave the beloved ones with disability in the north, potentially in a mosque or in a hospital, hoping for them to be safe, hoping for them to be well cared of, but yet again, without any of their family members with them, or to stay all in the north and risking all to die. 
This is the choice that we are receiving. This is what we are getting on the phone. This is what happens. And this is every day. And there is also another fundamental question that we have to ask in ourselves. Even if they made down, even if they manage with impossible efforts, really, I cannot even imagine myself the efforts that they're going to do in working all those kilometers and getting final safe. Uh, can we actually affirm that the South is safe? I mean, when we deem a certain area as safe, there is a lot of international standards to call it safe. Are we meeting those standards in the south of Gaza? Absolutely not. Will they receive food? No. Will they receive water? No. Will they have access to health services? No. Will they have a dignified life? No. The answer is a continuous and resounded no to all of these questions. So also it's important to, to understand this when we talk about uh, like a safe passage down the south. And I think that it's quite emblematic, a story that we collected a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his name is Khaled. He actually decided and chose to flee from the north to the south. He's currently hosted in uh, a shelter in the south. And he's voluntarily choosing not to eat, not to eat enough, because he cannot go to the toilet. Toilets are not accessible in the shelters. There is, and I really would like you to remember this number. There's one out of 125 people toilets. There's one out of 108 people showers. This is the reality into a shelter. And he's choosing not to eat in order to minimize the time of a day in which he has to go to the toilet. He's not showering. He lost his medication and he cannot procure new ones. And despite the fact that we, as a child, we would like to help, the only kind of help that we are able to provide him is some kind of mobilization with our team to make sure that his pain is not unbearable, but we cannot transport him. We cannot support him in access any health services. We cannot support him in getting his medication. We cannot support him with basic needs. As many others also, as Sean said, we release our stocks to the shelters, to people in need, but nothing is coming in. So all our resources are exhausting unless they increase, they increase the number of trucks that get in. And above all, fuel is restored. Persons with disability do need fuel to access services. So this fuel is actually life, no less than that. And on top of that, even if we were able to, humanitarian workers do not have safe passage. We cannot move. We do not have items. We have constantly to balance between the risk of movements and the risk of being caught in a shelling. This is the reality of every day of any aid worker. Aid workers need to be granted unpeded access, safe access to be able to support people. And last but not least, and this will be my conclusion, I mean, there's been multiple discussion and I know that Bushra is going to brief us more on that, on the humanitarian pause of four hours that is being negotiated, although not really in place. I, I need to mention that humanitarian pauses of four hours per day is not even nearly enough for the kind of humanitarian aid that is needed into Gaza. Four hours do not support humanitarian aid workers in providing food to more than 2 million people. Do not support to provide water to more than 2 million people. Do not support us in having persons with disabilities, injured people, and whomever is in need to access health services. All of them are continuous services. They cannot be reduced a few hours per day. And this is why we need a ceasefire. And we need it now because the ceasefire and an impeded access to humanitarian aid in, is the only way in which we can actually save lives right now. Thank you. Over to you. Daniela, thank you so much. We don't normally hear from the perspective of how disabled folks are particularly affected in conflicts like these, and that was very valuable. Um, we'll hear now from Steve Sosby, who's the president of Palestine Children's Relief Fund. He's founded PCRF uh, in 1991. It's one of the most esteemed and effective nonprofits in the Middle East, performing thousands of life-altering surgeries for sick and injured children annually. With the strategic presence of six offices in the West Bank, 
three in Gaza and one each in Jordan and Lebanon. PCRF ensures that children in dire need have access to the critical care they require, bridging the gap left by the limitations of the local healthcare system. Steve, I was wondering if you could also provide a window into the impacts on children in Gaza. Yeah, well, thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to join the esteemed members of this board um, or this panel. Um, briefly, I mean, just to give you a background of, of, in addition to what you mentioned, uh, we've been working for 30 years. I started PCRF as a way to contribute to the need, the very specialized and focused areas of providing medical care for children in particular in the West Bank and Gaza. And this was back during the first intifada when things were not nearly as bad as they are today, although they were pretty bad. It just shows you how terrible the situation has become and uh, unlivable, obviously, these days in Gaza. Uh, our goal as an organization is to, uh, much like an era, which is to not just have to deal right now with the conditions on the ground, but hopefully develop more sustainable programs and systems within the health sector and within Palestinian society, particularly in Gaza. We've been focusing in the last few years on doing needs assessments and developing strategic plans on and supporting the specialized care for children in Gaza and all areas of the health system, from neurosurgery to cardiac surgery. We built the only pediatric oncology department in the Gaza Strip, which is now, uh, you know, whether NTC Hospital is still standing or not, we'll, we'll, deter we'll figure that out when the, when the dust clears, but the, the, all the patients have been kicked out. Uh, you know, the hospital itself is empty. So our department is, is now no longer functioning. But the point here is that you know, a lot of work was being done by organizations like PCRF, by Anira, that is in many cases being destroyed and has been easily destroyed after years and years of investment and support for our brothers and sisters in the health sector in Gaza. Now, to get to your question, uh, and thank you for, um, for inviting me again, uh, the issue of whether there should be a ceasefire or not, I, I think... Uh, um, you know, uh, everybody's mentioned clearly stated that there has to be. And I think the bottom line is there has to be a ceasefire because innocent children are being killed. We know that the official number, and this is just because the number is probably not absolutely determined yet with all of the various kids that have been killed, but we know it's 4,500 uh, according to UN estimates, but another 1,500 are buried under rubble. So let's say that number is 6,000. Now, 6,000 is a terrible, terrible number, and it's beyond the scope of even comprehending from a human perspective. But let's put it in relation, relative terms for Americans, because we have 72 million children in the United States. The Gaza people have 1 million children. They've lost 6,000 children. If we were to lose the equivalent of 6,000 children based on our population, we would have 432,000 dead American children in the United States, as a, not injured, not, and that's another number that's beyond, that's ghastly, but that would be 432,000 dead children in one month as a result of a foreign occupying army bombing our homes, bombing our schools, bombing our churches, bombing our mosques, bombing our hospitals. There are no safe places at all in the Gaza Strip for these children to seek refuge and to avoid this onslaught of violence and high-tech weapons, which are leaving them dismembered and uh, and beyond the uh, ability for their parents to even identify their bodies, as we've all seen so graphically portrayed over the past month and, and several days. Um, the impact that it's having on children is not just the casualties of war, or if that's what you want to call this, of, of this onslaught of violence, of this wave of, of violence that's come upon the Gaza people over the past since October 7th, and even far beyond that. We've been treating kids, and you know, I've been the first child that I that ever came out of Gaza for medical treatment in 1991, even before I started PCR, was a triple amputee, a 10-year-old boy who had uh, lost his limbs from an he Israeli helicopter dropping a bomb near his home in Han Yunus. So this has been going on for generations, as, as we all know. But this current onslaught of violence is, is a new era of trauma, a new era of, uh, of aggressive violence we've never seen in Gaza before, at least not in our lifetimes. And therefore, um, what the impact that it's having is not just in the death toll, as I mentioned before, which is over 6,000, and you know the equivalent is, is beyond our scope to comprehend, but it's also in the long-term uh, number of children who are injured and going to have a lifetime of physical injuries, children who are permanently disabled now, kids in wheelchairs, kids with amputations, kids with uh, uh, trauma that will last on the rest of their, physical trauma that will last on the rest of their lifetime. That's estimated, according to many surgeons and people that we work with on the ground in Gaza, um, to be over 9,000 children who have these kind of permanent disabilities. One of the things we're currently doing on the ground there, uh, in addition to... Um, uh, we've evacuated already 20 kids out of Gaza for cancer treatment in Egypt, uh, working with some international partners, to, and we have another 25 to get out. That's a small number, of course, uh, when you compare with the, uh, the the fact that over 100 children are being killed every single day in the Gaza Strip. Sometimes that number is two or 300. 
Um, but it's it's something that it kind of sets a precedent for hopefully getting a lot of these injured children out as well. We have our first child coming to the U.S. who has a significant uh, injury from a bombing of her home. She's a seven-year-old girl. And uh, we hope to get her to the U.S. And we hope that this will open and pave the way for many more kids who are injured to get treatment. Again, until the situation, is, as Sean mentioned, opens up and enables us to provide aid on a much larger scale, we have to address and help these children in any way we can. Um, the, the issue of what's affecting children uh, is not just the, the number of injuries. As Daniela also mentioned, uh, Daniela mentioned as well, um, the impact that it's having psychologically and on the social needs of kids and of people in general is, again, it's hard for us as human beings to even comprehend because we're, we haven't gone through it. And, uh, you know, if you're not gone through these circumstances, and these conditions, it's hard to really relate to it. But let's just understand for one thing that every single child, every single child, one million children in Gaza are now being psychologically traumatized. Um, there's not a child in the Gaza Strip that's going to ex escape this onslaught of violence that has been going on over the past five weeks, five plus weeks, um, without being permanently scarred. Now, how do we as organizations who have a mental health program, which we do, um, to help provide some form of treatment or therapy or counseling or support for these kids with with what's called usually post-traumatic stress disorder, but in this case, is that is not an applicable term, although the symptoms are very similar because it's not a post-traumatic, it's a current traumatic stress. And as long as the uh, violence is, continues as a form of occupation, as a form of imposed poverty, as a form of restrictive movements and denial of basic freedoms and protection and security for the people in Gaza, they will continue to be subject subjugated to this form of trauma and violence, which makes it extremely difficult for us and for any organization to come in and try to heal not only the bodies of these kids, which is what we've been doing for years, but also to be able to heal their minds and their souls, which are being exposed to the most graphic forms of violence. Their homes are being destroyed. Their parents are being killed. They're being injured. They're living uh, in these UN crowded UN schools or in tents or in warehouses or in any place or even in the streets. Uh, for weeks and for months now, and without any pr uh, protection, winter's coming. Many of these kids don't have adequate clothing. Um, all of them are becoming food insecure and not having clean water to drink, and that poses another health issue. Um, so the impact is just really, it's complete and absolute beyond the entire population of the Gaza Strip, particularly the children. And the long-term consequences of the impact, the trauma that's being imp imposed upon the people in Gaza is not just the physical trauma, but the significant damage that's being done to the entire psychological, um, let's just say health of the people in Gaza and the long-term consequences for one day building a civil society there when you have a traumatized population. Um, that's going to be a huge challenge for aid organizations, for relief organizations, for those of us who are truly committed to healing the Palestinian people and our Gaza brothers and sisters in the best way we can. We're facing a huge, huge, uh, in some ways, even insurmountable challenge and task because the root cause of their trauma remains the violence and the occupation and the lack of freedom and equality and security living in the Gaza Strip. Now, there was one more point I want to raise when you mentioned the welfare of children in Gaza. It's not only the trauma that's been imposed, and I just mentioned for the psychological trauma of, of being exposed to violence on a continuous basis, 24 hours, seven days a week, every single day of these poor, innocent children. It's not just the physical trauma of 6,000 dead children, and I think something like uh, 10,000 injured children, maybe more than that, with significant casualties and not getting adequate medical care. Let's remember one thing, which is the hospitals there are not able to provide these children even the most basic medical services uh, that they deserve and that they need, which is, uh, and uh, you know, when a child is injured, they deserve the best care. Many of these kids are getting treatment without adequate medical, without adequate pain relief, without anesthesia, without um, having the time. The surgeons don't have time often to give them the correct medical care that they would deserve and they would be able to get if it wasn't a huge backlog of life-saving care that other children are waiting for in triage and in the emergency department. So in addition to all that, as you have this huge number of kids there, and we've already mentioned the cancer department that we opened and we were running for years since 2019 in Gaza, which had provided hundreds of children with cancer and other blood diseases and blood disorders, free medical care at a high quality level, which showed equal amounts of success and survival rates compared to uh, United States, uh, American hospitals, that department's closed and those kids, either because we're able to transfer some of them outside, the ones we can find, many of those kids are going without treatment and their cancer is relapsing. They're, the cancer is coming back, they're getting sicker, and some of them are going to die. 
That's true with the kids with heart disease. We as a, are the main organization that brings in volunteer medical teams and surgery teams into the Gaza Strip and do that on the, you know, hundreds of doctors and nurses come in every year through our organization. We provide open heart surgery for kids born with congenital heart disease. There's 500 babies born a year with heart problems in Gaza. And we were the main organization saving their lives through teams from all over the world. We had a team from Italy coming two weeks after October 7th. They were coming on the 15th actually a week later, and we had a low list of kids with congenital heart disease ready to have open heart, life-saving open heart surgery from that team. Those kids are canceled. What's going to happen to them? Some of them are going to die. That's true with kids on dialysis. That's true with kids on, with cystic fibrosis. That's true with kids who are on medication and have chronic medical needs and medical conditions that can't be met. We have been providing solar energy for kids in homes who have uh, medical problems that needed continuous energy supplies. And as you all know, Gaza doesn't have, even before October 7th, was only going to do four or five hours a day, even less than that of uh, electricity and a lot of them had you know needs in their homes for breathe artificial breathing respiratory machines that were helping to keep these poor kids with cerebral palsy and other things alive we were building solar panels for them to be able to power these uh, um, these uh, machines that could save their lives a lot of those uh, solar panels and those kids are dying now because uh, those solar panels have been damaged as sean mentioned with some of the projects they've been doing in solar work and uh, and that's another casualty now those aren't going to be listed in the casualty numbers but they are casualties of, to this violence. So the number of 6,000 dead and missing children right now is much higher than that because of the impact on the health sector, which has completely been destroyed and has collapsed for the most part in the Gaza Strip. That's affecting not only those kids who are injured and need medical care and can't get it adequately now, but it's also affecting kids who have so many other medical conditions that were getting treatment, either through our organization or the work of the great work of ANIRA and other organizations on the ground there. Those kids aren't getting treatment now, and those kids are going to be... Um, um, casualties of the conflict as well. That's why we need a ceasefire. That's why it's a moral imperative on all decent, peace-loving people. Not only that, we all, the vast majority of people all over the world want a ceasefire. It's the lack of political support, political courage, and political will by our leaders, which has caused me great shame as an American. More, moreover, shame as a human being to see that our leaders don't have the courage or the wherewithal to call for a ceasefire when we see a genocide being committed against these poor innocent children in Gaza. So thank you for having me. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. Steve, thank you. And again, your experience is extremely valuable. Um, the information you've provided to this briefing. Next, we'll be hearing from Bushra Khalidi, uh, who is Oxfam America's policy lead in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Oxfam is a global organization that fights inequality to end poverty and injustice. They offer life-saving support in times of crisis and advocate for economic justice, gender equality, and climate action. Uh, we've recently seen an agreement on allowing for a four-hour pause in fighting, and we'd like to get your thoughts, Bushra, on whether this is an adequate measure to address the humanitarian crisis right now. Thanks so much for having me tonight. And I mean, I think my colleagues covered uh, a huge ground, so I'll try to keep it uh, as short and brief as possible so we can take a few questions. Um, I first wanna address, address the ambiguity around the humanitarian pause that um, we've heard flying around in the last couple of, I mean, a week maybe, uh, particularly from uh, the US um, it's very unclear what this humanitarian pause, aside from the four hours um, a day, what it looks like. Um, uh, it's also not clear whether the parties have agreed to it. So we don't know if that started, uh, if it, it, it will start, what time, what day. Um, and uh, at least from uh, the Israeli media perspective, it's clear that um, Israeli officials have not called for on humanitarian pauses. So. Um, in, in, in reality or on the ground, uh, there's no humanitarian pauses currently occurring so that we're very clear. Um, there have been windows given to people to uh, be evacuate or forcibly displaced to the South. Um, and these have been a few hours, um, about four hours in the afternoon for the last week. But we also know that those safe routes were not safe. Um, they were bombed last week. And uh, we also know that areas in the South have also been um, targeted um, and, and bombed, um, including residential areas uh, and residential structures um, and shelters. So um, nowhere is safe in Gaza. Uh, the illusion that the South uh, has uh, safe areas or safe zones, that's, that's untrue. Uh, and I know this um, 
from my own personal um, story uh, where all my in-laws have been already displaced twice between the South um, and the North and have gone back to the South um, trying to find uh, adequate shelter. Um, so four hours is not enough. And I think my colleagues have said uh, and talked about the logistical impossibility and challenge of delivering aid in four hours. I'm not exactly sure how 39 babies um, in incubators from Shifa Hospital are supposed to be evacuated in a window of four hours. I'm not exactly sure um, how Steve explains that, you know, we need medical teams in to operate, uh, to, 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 to conduct extremely difficult operations in four hours. Um, uh, we need to be able to secure our teams that are going to go inside and, and guarantee their safety that they will not be um, bombed um, while delivering aid. Uh, we also need to understand if this humanitarian pause um, accepts to have fuel in. Is this part of the agreement? Because as Danila said it, uh, fuel uh, for, for many or most of Gaza, I would also argue that it is life. Half of Gaza uh, relies on fuel. And this is because of an illegal blockade that Israel imposed before the 7th of October for 16 years, leading to complete human, uh, 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 an entire population basically being on the brink of a humanitarian crisis, which Oxfam and other of my colleagues have probably called and warned uh, the international community of before the 7th of October. So there was no electricity before this, or very little, um, and very little water as well. Uh, so now we're we're back. It's it's we're we're not at square zero. We're 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 back at the minus in terms of the avalanche of needs uh, that we're seeing on the ground in Gaza, with 2.2 million people being collectively punished in a, a very small, densely populated area. Um, with you know what we have seen is indiscriminate uh, bombing of hospitals, of mosques, of churches, of schools, of shelters, of bakeries, of every single um, essential civilian infrastructure that a population needs to be able to at least survive. Um, so uh, the situation, the humanitarian situation, four hours is not going to operate hospitals. It's not going to operate power plants. It's not going to operate water station pumps. It's not going to operate the wheat mill the only, the one and only wheat mill in, in Gaza. Um, it's not gonna allow uh, for uh, uh, aid to reach the north, the most northern point of Gaza and back again, because that is a two, a one and a half, one and a half to two hour drive, at least to the north. So it, it's just very unclear what this humanitarian pause is. And, and, and frankly, um, uh, it's nowhere near enough uh, compared to the needs right now of 2.2 uh, 2 million people um, in Gaza. Uh, and a ceasefire is imperative because it helps actually stop a loss of civilian life. Um, we've heard uh, uh, Steve put it into perspective uh, what the sheer amount of numbers of, of Palestinians killed in the last four weeks and the total destruction of civilian infrastructure um, like schools and hospitals, uh, but also cultural history like old mosques and churches. And without a ceasefire, um, it's really impossible um, for any uh, and all parts of um, the international humanitarian system in Gaza that you know we have been working in for decades uh, to really uh, distribute, but also help uh, the protection um, uh, and lives of civilians. Um, I'd like to also speak on um, something from a position from the USA that we have seen um, where under the current circumstances, uh, the US government is granting Israel access to um, munitions um, that are extremely damaging, extremely fatal, um, uh, particularly 155 millimeter, millimeter artillery. Um, and that undermines further the protection of civilians in Gaza um, and the respect for international humanitarian law and the credibility really of the Biden administration. I mean, really, it's just very difficult to imagine uh, a scenario in which high explosive of 155 millimeter artillery cells could be used in Gaza in compliance with international law, which is also what we've heard from the Biden administration that, you know, IHL is important, we need to protect civilian lives. Um, and so without a ceasefire, it's just really unclear um, uh, how that's how that's going to happen. And even though a humanitarian pause, however well intentioned that is, it's just too short, given the extensive um, destruction and the state of the roads and and everything that we've talked about um, in the last uh, 45 minutes. Uh, it's too fragile, fragile 
It poses real operational challenges. And knowing that hostilities might resume um, uh, makes us as humanitarian workers and teams uh, unable and hesitant even to uh, deliver aid. Uh, and that's if Israel accepts to open the borders. Um, if we really want to adhere to international law, we put protection of civilians at the forefront. Um, it means to not bomb indiscriminately uh, civilian infrastructures and people's homes. Um, it, it, it also means that we allow unfettered um, aid and teams in to provide the necessary aid to the avalanche of needs we're witnessing. It means aid should be delivered equitably across the strip. And it also means that Israel should open its borders and turn, turn back the water and turn back the electricity and allow fuel in and allow telecom lines to also be back on so that humanitarian teams, medical teams can communicate with each other. Um, it also means that trauma injuries should be allowed to evacuate through safe passage to either Egypt or inside Israel or the West Bank. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish by a, a very um, just brief um, sentence that we really think that a ceasefire is the only credible solution. We've seen widespread support on the street uh, of every big city around the globe, uh, petitions garner garnering hundreds of thousands, if not millions of supporters, including from the largest humanitarian organizations, many of us here today speaking to you. Um, every passing moment undersc underscores um, the gravity and the urgency of the situation. The rejection of a ceasefire call um, by some governments, including the US, um, it's really concerning. Um, uh, the situation is cat catastrophic. We cannot stress that enough. And to be frank, we think that a ceasefire would be a good um, conduct for negotiations, for real negotiations, and for a real political solution once and for all, so that you know we as humanitarian organizations are no longer just on the reactive and responding to escalation after escalation and humanitarian crisis because of an illegal blockade, but rather we're really supporting to empower Gazans and Palestinians to achieve um, their rights uh, uh, with equality and justice um, and for them to have, to be empowered to leave, live lives that are really dignified. Um, and that's what we want to be doing um, as, as humanitarians. And I think the only way uh, is a ceasefire, especially four weeks in uh, to this war. Thank you. Bushra, thank you so much. Um, another voice that's so incredibly important to hear right now. We uh, received a, an important question and there is a, a consensus here from the speaker is that um, the most basic need right now is safe passage, is, is the stopping of bombings and airstrikes in order to be able to carry out any humanitarian efforts whatsoever. But we also had a question asking what is a specific resource gap that your organizations might be facing. Um, Danila, you touched upon that a bit, but we would like to hear more if there are other answers to that question. And I think that it's safe to say, considering that a safe passage for your colleagues is provided. Yeah, I mean, we need so much, <laughs> but uh, just to keep it short and uh, to, to the essential, definitely we need safe passage for our team. Uh, we need a consistent and steady flow of humanitarian aid inside Gaza. And including this steady flow of humanitarian aid inside Gaza, we do need fuel. I need to reiterate that fuel is life, not just for uh, running most of the basic needs that but also to run some actually life-saving activities. We are talking about hospitals. We are talking about sewage plump. Imagine what will happen if really sewage tomorrow stops. We are looking into so many epidemics that may occur. And I think we all know what is the basic consequences of not being able to run basic services and life-saving activities inside Gaza. Again, we need to reiterate the safe passage for our team, and that can happen only with a ceasefire. And I want to be very much clear on that. 
only ceasefire can guarantee for our teams and also for the population enough stability to regain a minimal, minimal access to basic needs. And then I let my colleagues compliment. Look. Would anyone else? Thank you, Sean. Well, I, you know, I saw a dark piece of humor and, and, uh, and, and it's controversial, but I think history will show that it was, uh, it was poignantly true that the, the cartoon says um, uh, they're pausing the genocide for four hours a day in order to carry out ethnic cleansing. And um, I think history in the end will, will show that that's exactly what's happening. Um, if you're if you're putting a humanitarian pause in so that you can force people from their homes in the name of safety, um, then, you know, something's not right yet. Um, so I'd say the bombs have to stop. Uh, and, and yes, you, even if they're not stopping, there are other things we have to do. People have to get to some place that's relatively safe, but it's really hard. I mean, I'll just say with our 12 staff, three of them are still in Gaza city and, and we talk to them and we tell them move. Um, it's not safe there and they're not moving because they're, they're with family and they know they can't take everyone. Some of the family members are frail and they don't trust that they can make it safely and that they'll feel safe in the South. And they know that that neighbors and, and, and other friends and family have moved South and then come back North, either because they didn't feel a whole lot safer or because there, there just wasn't anything for them. And the people who are remaining in, in, in Gaza City are, um, some of the most poor because they don't have anything to take with them and there's no there's nothing uh so it's um it's it's hard to fathom i mean it, it's hard to fathom the, the what what seems like certain death staying in gaza city and deciding not to leave i think it's hard for all of us to fathom how bad things have to be for someone to make that choice thank you sean would anyone else like to answer this question or should i move on to the next one Okay, one question we've been receiving from several different uh, attendees of this panel is kind of questioning uh, Hamas's position after a ceasefire. So my question to all of you is, how do you respond to people who say that a ceasefire would allow, allow Hamas to regroup? Um, and in your eyes, if there is a ceasefire, what's next? I'd be happy to take that um, and my colleagues, please um, add uh, to whatever I'm missing. But I think at least from um, from our perspective, uh, what we're saying and what we've been saying for years um, in terms of the situation in Gaza and the wider occupied Palestinian territory, it's important to, to, rem to, to remember that there's no Hamas in the West Bank, but this, year's, this year in the West Bank was a record number of Palestinians killed by Israeli forces. It was also a record number of people displaced, forcibly displaced because um, of the expansion of settlements and military outposts in Area C. And here, Hamas doesn't govern. Um, so we are talking about a wider framing of blockade and military occupation um, that has um, kind of, uh, uh, that you know that this is this is our daily day to day life here. We live under military occupation, and what we're saying is that repression, repression and occupation um, has always met met by resistance here in the West Bank and in Gaza, uh, with different levels of, of 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 war crimes and atrocities committed uh, by Hamas and other factions. Uh, but this kind of tragic historical uh, cycle of violence and counter violence. We think, uh, at least, that Oxfam can only be resolved by peaceful processes, and ultimately, an end to the occupation and an end to the blockade and escalating violence. We know harms innocent lives, um, and 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 deepens the wounds of division, um, and makes peace more elusive. Um, and Israel certainly has um, the mandate and a, a, a means to address address individual threats and and specific armed factions, but sustaining a long-term military occupation over an entire population 
is challenging and maybe it's becoming counterproductive. Um, and the aspirations of an entire population and people for freedom and self-determination um, can't be indefinitely suppressed by any force. And, um, you know, we strongly advocate and we always have, not just now, for a comprehensive negotiated solution in, based on international law and human rights rooted in inclusive dialogue, um, mutual respect and understanding uh, of all people. Um, so I think that's what would be my answer to that question. Thank you, Bushra. Would anyone else like to answer this question? But I think from my perspective, if I may just add that I don't think it is the job of the humanitarian community to answer this question, if I may really very blunt on it. I think that this is the job of the politics. This is the job of the parties and of influential the parties in the conflict and also the parties that uh, and the stakeholders that are working towards achieving a ceasefire and a political solution in the area. So our job is to deliver aid and to sustain civilians and their dignity. This is our job. What we can make is just a call for the parties to work towards a ceasefire and a long lasting peace that is a justice and a just peace for everyone. I think there is an important distinction here to be made in such regard. And a second point is regarding that I don't think wars are solved with assumptions, but just with dialogue and negotiations. So I'm not sure how much if and where and how, I don't know, would help in that specific situation. Over. Shonda, it looks like you also want to answer the question. You know, I... I um... In some ways, I don't want to answer it. I, I agree completely with Daniela. It's not our, our role to answer it. Um, I will say not not as a near a president, but but as a as a person, as a human being, and someone who's seen a lot of transitions around the world. I think um, I think that uh, it's important to recognize that there is a resistance movement and there is an occupation. People say that it's complicated and really it isn't complicated. There's an occupation and a resistance. Now, I don't, I don't think anyone on this call ever condones uh, or justifies killing of innocent civilians anywhere for any reason. Um, and terrorists do that. Um, I also think it's important to remember that Terrorism is called terrorism because it has a political component. You can you can disagree with the politics. You can say that it's wrong. You can say it's strategically wrong. You can absolutely say that it's uh, uh, immoral and a, and a war crime. Um, but if there weren't a political component, they would just be called serial murderers. Um, and I do think I don't I don't think it will be Hamas. Hamas doesn't have uh, the support of. Palestinian people, but I think we, you know, we should remember we've seen lots of transitions in the world from oppression to freedom and justice that included the work of outlawed terrorist armed groups that eventually were part of politics. And again, I don't know if that's going to be Hamas or it's going to be someone else, but eventually uh, the arc of history will bend towards justice and someone on behalf of Palestinian people who might have condoned, might have participated in uh, violence as a means to a political end will will be part of a political solution. Um, I'd prefer that, that the armed groups aren't part of the political solution and that the unarmed groups and the peaceful uh, protesters are. But people who follow Palestine and Israel, Israeli history have seen that um, Israel is even more scared of peaceful protest. Uh, the peaceful protests are put down uh, just about as violently as anything else. So I, I just think that uh, people should recognize, and there are people in the, the US, I will not speak on behalf of the US administration or any political leaders, but uh, the US was talking with the Taliban. Uh, we talked with Al Qaeda. There was some talk before this, you certainly won't hear it now, but there was some talk that we should be talking with Hamas. Um, we don't. We follow the no contact policy, and we don't. Uh, we don't talk with Hamas. They don't ask us for anything. We don't ask them for anything. We work with communities, and 
as a humanitarian organization, we don't have a we don't even have a position on what the solution should be. We say one state, two state. We're just working for the human state. We don't know what the political solution is, and 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 we don't know who the players will be. We're only frustrated that there isn't movement towards peace, um, and so that we can get on with the real job of of human development. Thank you, Sean. That's very much appreciated. And I'll say that FCNL's position is that there is no military solution to address security threats to Israel, only a diplomatic and economic one. A ceasefire is the first step and a possible off-ramp, and then we can double down on multilateral diplomacy to sustain peace. Uh, and I very much back that as an Israeli who's lived in southern Israel. Um, we have one more question. This is based on some of the questions in the Q&A section, as well as questions we've received before the briefing, um, which is, have there been any transmission of realistic terms from either side? Which diplomatic corps is best situated to negotiate between the warring parties? Does anyone have a position on how a ceasefire could help bring the hostages home? As you've mentioned in your positions, this might not be what you are positioned to answer, but I, I think it's still valuable to hear your, your answers to these questions from the humanitarian perspective. Would anyone care to answer? I'll, I'll just say quickly, I can't imagine the, the pain and anguish and fear that families are going through that have hostages. And yes, uh, the release of hostages should be part of all of this. There needs to be a ceasefire that needs to be released. Hostages, this is so painful for so many people. Um, uh, I'll just say that. Hmm. Oh, do you mind, oh, go ahead, then I'll uh, see, please. I already spoke. It's okay. I was just going to echo what Sean said. I think we're all it, this is a terrible human tragedy for so many people in Israel and in Palestine and Gaza. And I think all of us feel the pain and, and know, um, you know, as much as we can um, com, com, connect with people, how terrible they must be, what the struggle and pain that they're going through. Sorry, it's hard to express that just because it's been so much human emotion over the past month. It's sometimes hard to find the right words. So I apologize for that. And we definitely feel the suffering and the pain of our Israeli and Jewish brothers and sisters who are going through this terrible crisis. And, uh, you know, we hope that this issue, this issue of Gaza, this issue of occupation, this issue of um, inequality and lack of self-determination and equality for the Arab population in, in the West Bank and Gaza can be resolved in the way that will provide peace and security for everyone, Israelis as well, of course. And um, this is what needs to be addressed, hopefully in a final uh, peace process or panel, final solution that has been long overdue. It's in the best interest of the Israeli people as well as for the Palestinians, of course, to find a solution to this complex, but not so complex problem. And maybe the process of solving it might be a little bit complicated, but the root cause and the root challenges, as Sean said earlier, are not that complicated. It's just an issue of equality, freedom, uh, self-determination, and, uh, and justice. And we hope that that will be on the agenda when there are talks to finally resolve this issue. Thank you so much. Danila, would you like to add something? No, maybe, of course, I echo what my colleagues said, that the human pain, especially in a hostage situation, is unbearable. So it's like I don't even feel entitled to speak about it because I cannot imagine it. And I echo that definitely should be part of any talks. But I would like mostly to answer to the first question. It's like, no, we are not seeing any sign of a ceasefire coming along. Uh, and this is also, I believe, why we are here today, to actually raise awareness on that, on the need to talk about that, on the fact that whatever party, whatever government has the minimum capacity or influence on the parties to promote a ceasefire dialogue and discussion, I think we should use that. And I think I urge you actually to open the discussion in that regard. Over. Thank you. It's an important suggestion. And um, I think that uh, we're nearing the end. So I think every everyone should have a 60 second uh, closing word. Um, let's do Sean, Danila, Steve, then Bushra. 
Thank you. I thank you, uh, everyone, for joining this and uh, uh, staff of uh, the U.S. Congress. I urge you when you travel to the region, speak with Palestinians. Part of the problem here is that there has been an unequal um, uh, amount of information and contact and relationships uh, built. And uh, members of Congress and staff of Congress do not spend enough time getting to know Palestinians and. Um, and you talk, you talk with uh, progressive Israelis who are fighting as hard as anybody is for peace, and and the, the the Israelis and the Jewish Americans who are saying not in my name, and who recognize that the way the war the war is being prosecuted is not in the security interest of Israel, and 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 I I think it's important that you keep talking with them and encouraging them, but without knowing Palestinians, listening to Palestinians. Um, we, we, we just can't have any hope of really understanding what the possibilities are, what the fears are, uh, and the words of equal measures of peace and security and dignity and prosperity are just, they're just hollow if we aren't really working towards that and understanding what that would take. What does a Palestinian family that's living in fear for their lives and their children's lives and need when we talk about equal measures of peace and security. And, um, it saddens me no end that this administration in Israel, uh, you know, is 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 harming uh, its own citizens by the way that it's prosecuting this. And uh, I always remember at the end of I was in South Africa during the elections, which ended apartheid. It was a three days of election, and on the night of the second day, it was declared that. Apartheid was over, and the old regime was gone, and a new, a new dawn was was breaking. And they lowered the, the old South African flag, and they raised the new one. And some people were crying, some people were dancing. And the 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 commissioner of the national police, he be, he became the last white commissioner of the national police, was dancing. And a reporter asked him, "What are you doing? Why are you dancing? We've just lost our country." And he said, no, I'm dancing because we've just gained our freedom, too. And no one, as we say, and we say it, but we have to really understand it and believe it and uh, live it and work towards it, that no one is free until everyone's free. Thank you, Sean. Daniela? Well, I think that, I mean, maybe it's a little bit in the form of an appeal, if I may say. I think that I would like to urge the people that are here today. And again, thanks for being here today and showing willingness to listen, is to really consider the human catastrophe that is unfolded in front of our eyes. And therefore to call out a ceasefire. That is the starting point. That's still the, the starting point of any, any further negotiation and solution. We need a, a ceasefire. I think that that's all that I can say. Thank you, Danila. Steve. Well, I of course echo that, but in addition to that, I'm I've just can from my own personal experience, I've been going and visiting and even living in Gaza for over the past 35 years. And I can tell you that there's not a more kind, generous, uh, humble um people than the Gaza people. Um, and that's from exp traveling all over the world and meeting people from every culture and background. Of course, people are the same, but in general, despite the conditions that people in Gaza have endured over their entire lives of occupation and displacement and refugee status and poverty um, and continued violence being inflicted upon them and imposed upon them, they've continued to keep their humanity. And that's from my own personal experience as somebody who goes there by myself and goes through and drives through Gaza by myself. I've never had anything but positive interactions and with the people there um, in every aspect from the people who sell fruit on the streets to the physicians and um, you know, the you know, people at the very high level of education. It's, it's just universal. They're just a very kind, generous people who deserve better than this genocide that's being committed against them by our country. Steve, thank you. And Bushra. Well, I mean, first, thank you um, for
for making the time today. I know that everybody is very busy. Um, so thanking, thanking you for giving us the space. But I also just want to reiterate the call from millions and millions of people on the street that have elected these officials. Um, these are elected officials um, and they should be listening to their constituents. And I think their constituents are screaming very loudly that an immediate ceasefire is needed now. And this is from all specters of the political spectrum. Um, it's Jewish organizations, it's Israeli organizations, human rights defenders, it's of course, Palestinian campaigners, um, but really people from all across the board who probably have never marched before have been marching for Palestine in the last couple of weeks. And I really urge world leaders to heed that call. I mean, we cannot be louder than this, that we have never seen this amount of people protesting for one unified cause. And it's clear that it's a cause that's much greater than Hamas and Israel. And it's it's really a call of humanity. Um, and that's why so many people are behind it. That's why 700 organizations signed an open letter calling for an immediate ceasefire um, and an end to the to the blockade. Um, and 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 so I urge you to also speak to your respective representatives um, to remind them um, uh, that this call is supported by by millions of people around the world. Um, and I think we should um, heed that call and 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 an and immediate ceasefire should should be of no discussion. Um, and I, I really appreciate the words from Steve because um, of course I'm Palestinian, so me saying this might be biased, but really truly, uh, when I went to Gaza, I left my heart there. Um, it, it's truly a special place. And to know that more than half of it has been completely obliterated really, I think breaks every single person's heart on this panel that has worked there, that's been there, that has met their colleagues to know that this is happening. I mean, it a ceasefire should have happened yesterday. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Sean, do you wanna say something shortly? I, I'm sorry, very quickly. I just didn't wanna say, you know, I'm traveling around in the Gulf now and, and uh, and people are looking to the United States. They're looking for some leadership to, to understand that our unconditional support for Israel has to change and our lack of ability to recognize the aspirations and the humanity of Palestinians has to change. And leaders are, are, are telling me that. Um, and I'll leave you with, I, uh, I had a doctor's appointment shortly after the uh, bombing started and I, I, my doctor's an Afghan refugee and he said we were talking about this and he said you know it's hard to believe that in the future when they say they're committed to human rights they will not be believed and he wasn't talking about the Israeli government he was talking about the American government and the American society so think about that as we move forward this is not easy I understand the politics of it but let's try to get on the right side of history here, uh, meaning humanity. Thanks. That's such a great reminder, Sean. Thank you. Again, thank you to all of the panelists. I think it's really evident that this work is extremely draining and having colleagues and friends and family in Gaza is, is, is so difficult. Um, thank you for making the effort. Um, and thank you all so much to the attendees here for coming. We'd like you to keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a recording of this briefing and further resources, some from the humanitarian organizations that representatives of theirs spoke today. We appreciate you showing up. If you have any follow-up questions for the panelists themselves, please email kvon at demandprogress.org. Kvon is C-A-V-A-N at demandprogress.org. Look out for invites to future events in this series. And again, thank you all for coming and thank you panelists for speaking today.